Hey guys, if you've ever experienced the flow state, you'll know how awesome it is. And luckily for us, a clever Hungarian psychologist by the name of Mihai Csikszentmihalyi spent his life studying this exact topic. So let's take a look at the book that he wrote. For many years, Csikszentmihalyi studied how we can live a happier and more meaningful life. He researched this by measuring the happiness levels of people at random times of the day and recorded what they were doing at those times. He discovered that it is when people are engaged in certain activities that they are most happy. These activities are known as optimal experiences and they give rise to the state of flow. You are in the flow state when you are so involved in what you are doing that nothing else matters and time gets distorted. You are so focused on an activity that you lose sense of yourself. You might have experienced this if you've ever been lost in a good book. Whilst you're reading the book, you aren't aware of anything else that's going on around you. And when you eventually finish reading the book, you can't believe how much time has whizzed by. Csikszentmihalyi has used the term flow to describe this state of being, but you might have also heard it described in other ways. Athletes call it being in the zone, runners know it as the runner's high, and even bloody jazz musicians have a term for it. It's called being in the pocket. So what sparked Csikszentmihalyi's interest in the scientific study of happiness? Well, to give you a bit of background, he was born in Hungary in 1934 and was deeply affected by the Second World War. He noticed that despite the horrors of the war, there were some people that still managed to find a sense of meaning and purpose in the world. During a skiing trip to Switzerland as a teenager, Csikszentmihalyi attended a free lecture because he didn't have enough money to go to the movies. It turned out that the famous Swiss psychologist Carl Jung was the speaker. This triggered his interest in psychology, but the subject wasn't very popular in Europe at that time, so he emigrated to the United States of America. During his studies, he observed artists and creative types, and was interested in how people became so immersed in an activity and entered a state of flow, as he called it. So let's take a look at the findings of his life's work and the study of flow. Active versus idle. When we're idle, we don't have these optimal experiences that create flow. Yet in our free time, so many of us choose to be idle and sit in front of the TV like a couch potato. When we watch TV, we're not engaging our mind, we're just passively absorbing the information that's put in front of us. If we want to have these optimal experiences, then we have to be active. Because it's actually when we're working, creating, or striving to achieve our goals that we feel truly happy because this is when we enter the flow state. Enjoyment versus pleasure. Now this is a big one. Let's explore the difference between enjoyment and pleasure. Although these two words may appear to mean the same thing at first glance, if we look deeper we can see that there are clear distinctions between the two words. Pleasure comes from external sources such as food, drugs and sex. Pleasure provides a temporary happiness, but it is not sustainable. When you eat a donut, your taste buds can't believe their luck and you get a rush of pleasure. But the problem is that this pleasure is short-lived and you can't sustain it. Eating an endless amount of donuts will not lead to endless happiness. It will make you sick. Enjoyment, on the other hand, comes from within and can be sustained. It is found in the challenges of an activity and is a result of the growth and the accomplishment that we feel. Sometimes you might not even enjoy the activity at the time, such as when you're grinding out at the gym. But after you've smashed your workout and you get the enjoyable feeling of accomplishment, you feel great. Now, this isn't to say that pleasure is something that you should avoid totally, because pleasure plays an important part in the overall quality of our lives. There is nothing wrong with the pleasure that you get from eating that cheeky donut, but it is important to remember that pleasure alone cannot give you a happy and meaningful life. It is the balance of enjoyment and pleasure that will get you there. Order versus Entropy Flow helps to integrate the self because in that state of deep concentration, consciousness is unusually well ordered. Thoughts, intentions, feelings and all the senses are focused on the same goal. Experience is in harmony. As we just saw from Mihai's quote, it is when our consciousness is ordered that our experience is harmonious and we enter the state of flow. But what does it mean to have an ordered consciousness? Well. We can understand this by first looking at the opposite of order, which is entropy. Csikszentmihalyi says that entropy is the normal state of our consciousness, meaning that when we are alone with no demands on our attention, our mind resorts to chaos. You might have experienced this if you've ever been on your own with nothing to do. Your mind can jump around chaotically from one thought to the next, 
and it can actually make you feel quite sad or depressed. Some people try and escape this entropy by resorting to alcohol, drugs and gambling. These activities distract the mind from its psychic entropy, but they're not healthy or sustainable solutions. Instead, we can avoid this entropy by learning to incorporate flow into every aspect of our lives. But in order to do this, we need to understand the main components of the flow state. Let's explore the three main components of flow. I'm actually currently learning to play the guitar right now, so I use this example as an activity to help demonstrate these three main components. Number one, clear goals. It's important that the goals of the activity that you're doing are clear. When I play the guitar, for example, I know exactly what chords I need to play and in what order I need to play them. The goal doesn't have to be the end goal either. It can be a subset of smaller goals. For example, in chess, the end goal is to defeat your opponent, but within each move, your goal is to try and make the most effective play. Number two, immediate feedback. The feedback of the activity must be immediate. This means that at every moment you know whether what you're doing is getting you closer to the goal. When I play my guitar, I absolutely know straight away if I've hit a bum note. But when I'm playing and everything's going well, of course I know that I'm on top form. And it's this constant feedback that keeps you focused on the activity. And finally, number three, challenging. The challenge of the activity must be right for your skill level. If the activity isn't challenging enough, you'll become bored and apathetic. If the activity is too challenging, then you'll become overwhelmed and anxious. It's when the challenge to skill ratio is balanced that you can enter the state of flow. Rightio, let's take a look at how to incorporate flow into our lives. To make things easier, let's view our lives in terms of the time that we spend at work, the time that we spend alone, and the time that we spend with our friends and family. Despite the fact that many people are not happy at work, Work can often provide us with the conditions needed to enter the flow state. This is because there is usually a clarity of goals and you'll know what needs to be done. You often receive feedback, either from yourself as you know how well you're doing, or from the management who oversee your work. So far so good, but the final hurdle, which is the challenge to skill ratio, can sometimes trip us up and prevent us from reaching the optimal experience. Often our work or our workload is too challenging and we become stressed out. And on the flip side, some jobs aren't challenging enough and lead to boredom. Finding the right level of challenge can be difficult. My old brother once had a job in a factory. He would spend all day operating a machine which would put pages together to create catalogues. And now, my brother is a maths wizard, okay? And this mundane job was very much beneath his skill level. But he had the creativity to find a way to enjoy his work. Every day, my brother would try and beat his record of how many catalogues he could produce. He became known in the company for holding the highest record and it created a competitive environment where the other workers would try and beat him. So, if we look at this job in relation to the conditions that are required for flow, the job came with clear goals. He knew that he had to produce as many catalogues as possible and the job came with immediate feedback because if he operated the machine incorrectly the production process would fail. But it was the third component of flow, the skill to challenge ratio that was causing him a problem. But my brother found a way to pass the time and find a bit of enjoyment at work also. So that's work sorted. Now let's look at how to find flow when we're spending time by ourselves. Many people experience the most sadness when they are alone, but this needn't be the case. We can use what we have learnt to make our time spent alone much more productive and enjoyable. Sometimes when we're alone, we mindlessly whack the TV on or dive into social media apps. These activities provide respite after a long day at work, but they don't engage us and therefore will never become optimal experiences. It's okay to watch TV and to use social media, but be mindful of how much of your time you're spending on these activities and try to be aware of how they're actually making you feel. Me personally, I love watching a good TV series and I love connecting on social media but every now and then I'll catch myself in front of the TV or scrolling through my newsfeed and I'm not even enjoying myself. I'm simply distracting my mind. It's in times like these where I can use the teachings of this book to find a more enjoyable use of my time. There are an endless amount of activities that you can do on your own that can induce flow. Yoga and meditation are closely linked to the flow state because they inherently require focused attention, 
but to understand that these activities might not be your cup of tea. People experience flow whilst running, painting, playing an instrument, reading a book, and even playing video games. What works best for each person is different. It varies depending on their skills and their interests. But now that we have more of an understanding of the flow state, we are more likely to be aware of what activities can produce the optimal experiences that enrich our lives. Let's move on and take a look at the time that we spend with friends and family. Our interactions and relationships with people provide some of the most memorable moments of our lives, like good times spent on family holidays or mucking around with your friends. When we invest time and energy into the people in our lives, the experiences that we have with them are stronger and more meaningful. Even simple interactions with people we don't know, such as the cashier at the supermarket, can become rewarding when we invest a small amount of energy. Just by greeting the cashier with a friendly smile and asking them how their day is going will transform this everyday interaction into a more pleasing experience. And we can take the same approach to our relationships with our friends and family. It's so easy to take our foot off the pedal and stop paying as much attention to the people that we treasure most in our lives. We become complacent and this restricts our enjoyment. But luckily with a bit of care and attention, we can revitalize our existing relationships by investing some of our energy. And that's all for today, guys. Hopefully this video has given you a taste of how you can cultivate flow to enrich your life. See you next time. Love you, bye.